Well, if you have a Bible with you, I'd like to, to open your Bibles if you don't mind. You can see that the title of the message this morning is Faith in the Power of God. And I'd like you to open up your Bibles if you have one or look at your app to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And as I said earlier, uh, I, I really have struggled as far as uh, what to share. I've got notes. I've got a great message here. But I, I feel like maybe i got to go into a little bit different direction than what I intended initially. And uh, uh, you'll see why in maybe just a couple of minutes here. But let's uh, read our text here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. If you're there, say yes. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. The Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, says this, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Now we're to verse 4. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God that your faith would not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Notice what it says from the New Living Translation, verses 4 and 5 up on the screen. It reads this way. Paul says, And my message and my preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied only on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did this so you would trust not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. You know, our God is a powerful God. And I know that we can say that, and I know that uh, it's something that we mentally agree to. Uh, but so, for some time now, I've been a little bit concerned as to whether or not we as the people of God really believe that God is powerful. Uh, because many times, you know, we, we, we come across, I'm coming down here. I'm going to look at the whites of your eyes right now, all right? Uh, but anyway, you know, sometimes we get uh, thinking naturally. We get thinking, well, you know, this is impossible for God. Or we get thinking, you know, well, uh, this is not as important to God because this is a little thing. I can handle this. Uh, this is not as important to God or whatever it is. We get thinking about a variety of things, uh, but I just want to try with God's help uh, to encourage you today. And, and the thing that I, uh, I feel like the Lord wants me to share, and some of you uh, maybe have heard some of these things before, uh, but I, I'm going to share a little bit of my, and see, this is why I don't want to do it, because I'm going to get emotional. I hate that. But I'm going to share a little bit about my testimony, because let me tell you, God has done the impossible with me. And I know he's done the impossible with you as well, if you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior. Amen? Yeah. Amen. And so I'm just going to share a few things from my heart here today. I didn't want to. I, I lost sleep last night because I basically was saying, God, I've got a lot of good notes here, and I don't want to share about me. I don't want anybody going away from here uh, thinking and saying, well, you know, he just talks about himself. I don't like talking about all these things, but I felt like the Lord was saying, you know, it might help somebody. And if it helps one person, then it's worth it. Isn't that right? Yeah. Amen. So I'm just going to share a little bit of where I come from. And my, my testimony, you know, I know it's hard to believe, but I'm, I hate this. I hate it. Shake it off, Jay. Shake it off. I'm 60 years old now. And I think at 60 years old, I'm looking back and I'm reflecting a little bit, you know. And I was raised, I wasn't raised in a dysfunctional family, really. I mean, every family's a little bit dysfunctional, but my parents are still together today. And, uh, you know, I was never on drugs. People talk about testimony sometimes. They say, well, you know, what a great testimony. I mean, that guy was on drugs. He was an alcoholic. Uh, he did all these various things. And then God saved him. Thank God for those testimonies. But you know what? I was, I was always a good kid. But how many of you know there's a lot of good people going to end up in hell? Yeah. Because it's not our own goodness that's going to get us to heaven. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, 8 through 10, it says it's for by grace are we saved through faith? And that not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, lest anyone should boast. And so again, it's not by our own works or our own effort. It's not by any power that we have to be good because it's not about our own goodness. It's about the goodness of God that was demonstrated when he sent Jesus Christ to die for you and me. And so none of us are going to get to heaven uh, because we were good. We're going to get to heaven because we recognized we weren't good, that we were sinners and we needed forgiveness, and we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. And, and so, you know, I was a good kid. I always wanted to please my mother and father. Oh, Lord, have mercy. I'm sorry. I'm not usually this way. That's why I didn't want to do this, but it's going to help somebody. I always wanted to please people and all that thing, but I was kind of shy. I was very shy. And, uh, you know, when I was 12 years of age, I had a devastating thing happen to me. I lost the person that I loved the most, and that was my grandfather, my paternal grandfather. I was very close to him. 
and I was uh, named after him, actually. And, uh, you know, he was an outdoorsman, and I always loved the outdoors. You know, some of you already know this. You probably, it's probably, you know, getting just, uh, you know, boring to you now, but, you know, I was going to be a forest ranger. I was determined. I was going to be in the woods. You know, I always spent time as a kid in the woods with a gun and hunting, even by myself. I spent a lot of time by myself because, you know, being around people was kind of a stressful thing for me. I wasn't good around people, I didn't think. And even speaking in front of people, I would get, uh, I would get uh, you know, uh, hyperventilating. I'd get nervous. I wouldn't be able to talk to people very well. And, and all of those various things, you know, this inferiority complex issue uh, was something that really had to be dealt with. But like I said, God is the God of the impossible. Amen. And so, you know, at 12 years of age, I lost my grandfather. It was a surprise. Uh, a surprise. It was a shock. Uh, you know, and some of you, I'm sure you can remember the first time you lost uh, a person, a relative, especially that you were very close to and how it hurt your heart. And, uh, you know, I was angry at God. I, I was angry at the world, you know, because he just lived down the road. I mean, we lived in a rural area and we lived on the same road. And so I'd ride my bicycle uh, to my grandfather's all the time. I mean, we just we just do things together. He even welded on his, he had an old farm all a tractor. How many of you know what a farm all a tractor is? He had an old farm all a tractor and he actually welded a seat on his tractor next to his so that I could ride on the tractor with him. And so, oh, you know. But anyway, we were very close. And when he died, though, that did a, that did a number on me. And so after having been angry, you know, I cried out to God because I knew I needed help. How many of you know that the Bible says that, as David said one time in Psalm 34, he said, this poor man cried. He cried out, and the Lord heard him and delivered him from all of his fears. Isn't that right? And so you cry out for help. You know, crying out for help is one of the greatest prayers you can ever pray. You cry and you ask God to help you when you're going through trials, when you're going through heartache, when you're going through all these things. And I believe that when you do that with a sincere heart, uh, God will meet you. Isn't that right? Amen. So I cried out to help, and God met me. And I knew how to be saved. I knew how to have a relationship because my grandmother, she was a committed devoted believer in Jesus Christ. She watched all the televangelists. I mean, there was one guy out there, and most of you never heard of, Rex Humbard. She'd watch, watch Rex Humbard. She'd watch, uh, uh, you know, uh, Catherine Coleman. Uh, she would watch Oral Roberts. She loved Oral Roberts. I remember reading his magazine just as a boy, just as a little boy, reading his magazine called The Abundant Life, and I'd be awed by all the testimonies of miracles and, and signs and wonders, healings that took place. I mean, I would be in awe of that. Even though I didn't really know God at that time, I had a hunger for God. In fact, when I was really young, uh, really young, I don't even know how old, but I'm thinking single digits young, I remember having a vision. I, I know it sounds weird to you probably, but I had a vision of me being, uh, and I just knew intuitively that I was a missionary somewhere by the ocean and, and that there was... Uh, a lighthouse there. And of course, I, I threw that out. I, I didn't want to be a missionary. I didn't want to be a preacher. Who in their right mind wants to be a preacher? You know, really, I was raised in a nominal denominational church. You know, I'd go to church and go away being sad instead of glad. I'd go away because the preacher would usually preach the, the, the uh, current events and how the world's going nuts. And, and I, as a boy, would leave church thinking, man, oh, man, I have nothing to hope for. I mean, the world's just going to hell in a handbasket and all that kind of thing. I'd leave almost depressed after going to church. How many of you know when we're preaching the good news, we don't leave church depressed? Isn't that right? Amen. And the gospel means the good news. And so, you know, I, I didn't want to be a preacher. I didn't look uh, highly on preachers. I, I didn't think that they were worth uh, uh, following in any way. But you know what? God had another plan. And even though I had planned on a certain career, you know, to uh, be in forestry and all that kind of thing because I want to be away from people, you know, this is my mind. My mind was this way. But even though that was the case, then something else happened. I accepted Jesus when I was 12 years of age. And then at 17 years of age, now we're going back a while. I just told you not long ago that I just turned 60. I know I don't look a day over 59, uh, but nevertheless, you know, uh, at 17 years of age, I had an encounter with Jesus that just changed my life forever and just uh, turned everything around, ruined my plans, ruined my plans. And, you know, if you look in your Bible, just go over here to Acts chapter 1, if you would. Okay. 
In Acts chapter 1, Jesus is now risen from the dead in this record. And it says, beginning with verse 4, if you're there, say yes. It says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, And being assembled together with them, that's Jesus assembled together with his disciples, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Everybody say promise of the Father. Which he said, you have heard from me for John. Verse 5, here's the promise. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, these disciples were already saved. You say, how do you know they're already saved? Because if we went back to John's Gospel, chapter 20, we know that Jesus, on the day of his resurrection, appeared to them in the upper room, breathed on them, and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And they believed in their heart that Jesus was Lord, and they believed that he had risen from the dead, because obviously they had seen him die on the cross, so now they certainly believe that he risen from the dead. And what's the requirement to be saved? That you confess Jesus is Lord out of a heart that believes that God raised him from the dead, and you shall be saved, Romans 10. 9 and 10. And so these disciples were saved. And now at the end of these 40 days that that Jesus is with them, after he rose from the dead, he says another thing to them. He says to them, you fellas, you don't go anywhere. You don't leave Jerusalem until you receive something else. You need something else in order to carry out this commission uh, that I've commissioned you to carry out, uh, to carry out this work that God has ordained for you to work out. And it's called the promise of the Father. It's called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And these people were already saved. They already had the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them, and yet Jesus said there was something more. And you know, back in 1977, my parents started to go to a church that was different than the one we were brought up in. They began first going to a Bible study. In fact, the graduate of that, uh, or I should say the guy who started that Bible study was a graduate of the same Bible school I ended up going to in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And he started a Bible study. And he was beginning to teach the Bible. And I would see my father especially come home. My dad would come home and he'd be hungry for the word. He'd be enjoying the scriptures. He was a very shy man, also is. And very quiet individual, a machinist for 34 years for General Motors. And a very quiet man. And he'd be excited about the scriptures. And he'd be sharing some things. And all this various thing. And then one day they came home. And they said this to me. They said, your father got baptized in the Holy Spirit. He got baptized in the Holy Spirit. What was that? If you turn over here, let's see what that means. In Acts chapter 2, we're talking about what? We're talking about faith in the power of God. In Acts chapter 2 is the fulfillment of what Jesus told his disciples. He said in Acts chapter 2, it says in Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Are you there? This is, the, this is what he told them to wait for as we read in Acts chapter 1. It said, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them cloven tongues or divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and the initial physical evidence was they spoke with other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. Or they spoke with other languages. Other tongues is kind of an old-fashioned way of saying languages. It would have been literally better translated as languages. They began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. And one day back there in 1977, my parents came home from that Bible study and said, your dad got filled with the Holy Spirit and he spoke with other tongues. He spoke in other languages. In fact, he spoke loudly. Now, if you knew my dad, my dad never spoke loudly even in regular language, but the Holy Spirit came upon him and he was filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit got a hold of his tongue. He began to speak in other languages, other tongues. I know that sounds strange to those who are uninitiated, but this is from the Word of God. This is from the Bible. Now, I had heard of this event or this uh, this uh, phenomenon phenomenon before because you know back in those days you know uh, Pat Boone and his daughters were very well known in fact one of his daughters went to the same Bible school I did and uh, Debbie uh, uh, Boone was uh, one of the uh, well-known singers at that time back with some and all of that kind of thing and I had read in People magazine that they were baptized they, they were Christians and baptized in the Holy Ghost I heard of other tongues and then I heard about this Assemblies of God church over here And I heard, you know what? Those people at that Assemblies of God church believe in being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in other tongues. 
And so, you know, it's like the Lord was already preparing me for this. You know, I was just a, I was just a Methodist kid. You understand? My mother's side of the family was Roman Catholic, but we weren't raised Catholic. The only time I ever went to a Roman Catholic church as a kid was for weddings and funerals. You understand, right? My mother's side was Roman Catholic. My father's side was Methodist, but they weren't even good Methodists. I mean, my father and mother, uh, in the beginning, they would just drop us off for Sunday school, figuring out, figuring that if they couldn't straighten us out, the church would straighten us out or something. Isn't that right? But I remember eventually they started going to church. And I remember, you know, us boys, I was the oldest of three boys, and we had a sister as well older than me. But I remember Dad was sitting in the pew. He'd have his arm up there like that, and the three boys would be like that. And if any of us made a peep in the Methodist church, he'd just have his hand right there, and he'd slap us the side of the head. That's all he'd have to do, and we'd shut up right away. Isn't that right? And so, you know, we were raised in the Methodist church, and we weren't raised in, in a church that believed in the filling of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said... In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, if you'll go back there, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, it says this, after he told them to wait in Jerusalem, and verse 8, notice he describes this thing that he wanted them to wait for. In verse 8 of Acts 1, you're there, right? He said, but you shall receive power. Everybody say power. power. And remember, the title of the message is, God is powerful, but it's, it's faith in the power of God. It, it says, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so this experience called the baptism or the filling of the Holy Spirit and the experience of being uh, uh, receiving this uh, language, supernatural language, it's part of receiving power to live the Christian life. And so, you know, I know that there's a lot of denominations that don't believe in it, but there's a lot of them that actually do. I mean, we have all sorts of uh, groups, you know, that uh, at one time, believe it, there's even Catholics, that there's Catholic charismatic churches sometimes or services, special services, and they believe in this experience called being filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Assemblies of God, as I already mentioned to you, there's called a Church of the Four Square Gospel that's mostly in the Pacific Northwest, big, you know, decent-sized denomination. I mean, it's not something exclusive to us. This is the Bible. Everybody say the Bible. And anyway, when I found out that my father had been baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoken tongues, that's when I knew it had to be real. I knew it had to be real because my dad was always the most genuine, down-to-earth person that I had ever known. And I knew that if he experienced, I mean, he was an unemotional kind of guy. If he experienced God in that way, I knew it had to be real. And so when I knew that it was real, I wanted to inquire some more. I wanted, I've always been a searcher of truth. How about you? Is everybody with me here today? And so, you know, I began to learn the word. I began to go to their Bible study. I said to them, you know, they, they encouraged me to go to the Bible study. And I said, well, I'll go. This is, this is pretty much the gist of what I said. All right, well, I'll go to that Bible study. But I'm not going to be shouting hallelujah. I told them that right now. Here I am, 17 years old. I, I'm not going to say hallelujah. You know, one reason why I didn't say, I didn't want to say hallelujah is because I didn't even know what hallelujah meant. And I, I had enough uh, integrity to say, I'm not going to go shouting some word that I don't even know what it means just because I want to fit in with everybody else. Isn't that right? Yeah. And just for your information, hallelujah means praise the Lord, right? It means praise the Lord. And, and I said, well, I'll go with you, but I'm not going to raise my hands. And they said, that's all right. You don't have to say hallelujah. You don't have to raise your hands. You don't have to do anything. And so I conceded and said that I'll go ahead and go. And I'll tell you what, that... That pastor eventually became a pastor. He took that Bible study and made it into a church or developed it into a church. I mean, he began to teach the Bible. He taught the Bible in ways I'd never heard before because in my church, man, they never hardly opened up the Bible. They might have had uh, uh, one scripture in the beginning, maybe one midway through, whatever. They never really, I don't recall them ever expounding on the scripture or, or explaining the scripture. They weren't teaching the Bible. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? And now here we have uh, this pastor. I mean, he's teaching the Bible line upon line precept upon precept he's teaching the word and i'm getting excited this backward country kid not liking to be around people starting to get excited about the things of god and realize that i didn't know god's word said that i didn't know the bible said that and, and you know with all that backwardness part of that was also you know not thinking well of yourself and then finding out what god had to say and this pastor began to tell us uh, that the bible says that if you're in christ you're a new creation in christ old things have passed away all things have become new. The Bible says that we are overcomers through faith and that we're 
more than conquerors. The Bible says we can do all things through Christ who infuses us with strength. I mean, I found out more and more of who God said I was, and it set me free from that inferiority complex and, and worrying about what other people had to say about it. Isn't that right? Amen. It's so important we get into the New Testament especially. And we find out and look up all the in Him, in Christ, through Christ scriptures because it's in Christ that we are who we are by the grace of Almighty God. Amen. And I'll tell you, I began to hear the Word of God and it began to set me free. I want you to know that God is the God of the impossible because in the natural it would not have been possible. I was a backward, shy, introverted kid uh, and uh, uh, God did a miracle. I'm telling you, God did a miracle. Couldn't speak in front of people. I maybe know that's been blown out of the water now. Isn't that right? Is everybody with me here? And, and so he began to teach us a variety of things. And, and, and if you don't mind going to a couple other scriptures, notice in Acts chapter 10 now. In Acts chapter 10, you just flip over there a few pages. In Acts chapter 10, beginning with verse 44. Now this is when Peter went to Cornelius and his household. Now Cornelius was an Italian man. Thank God for the Italians. And all the Italians said? Amen. Amen. All right, Cornelius was an Italian man. And, and you know, Peter being a Jew, you know, he didn't know whether he ought to go to Cornelius and his household, but God did a supernatural work and got Peter there. And it says that as Peter was preaching in verse 44 of Acts chapter 10, it says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, that's speaking of the Jews, and who believed were, were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. The Gentiles, non-Jews, in this case, Italian folk. And so it says they were astonished because the Holy Spirit fell upon them as well. How did they know that? Well, let's read and find out how they knew that. It said, for they heard them speak, in verse 46, for they heard them speak in other tongues and magnify God. And magnify God. And so they spoke with other tongues and magnified God, and then they got baptized in water after that. And so again, the power of God. Jesus said, and you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And I'll tell you, I was hungry for God. I, I found this in the Word of God. I was taught this by this pastor, and I saw it in the Scriptures, and I delved into it, and I examined it some more because I was never one to, I was never one to just accept everything. You had to prove it to me, right? That's the way we ought to be. We ought to just be ones who search the Scripture. Notice Acts chapter 19 now, the 19th chapter. Acts chapter 19. It says, beginning with verse 1. If you're there, say yes. Acts 19, begin with verse 1, it says, And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples. So they were followers. They were disciples. They were followers of Jesus. And he said to them, Did you, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So he recognized them as what? Believers, right? He recognized them. He saw that they were believers. And he said, have you received the Holy Spirit? Now, we do receive the Holy Spirit the moment we accept Christ dwelling within us. He indwells us. He regenerates us. We're made new creations in Christ. But what Paul's talking about here, did you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit since you became a believer? And he's speaking of this baptism, this filling of the Holy Spirit, where they will receive power. And they, like us Methodists back in the day, they responded the same way. So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Spirit. And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, as referring to water baptism. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they what? They spoke with tongues and prophesied. And so you know what? I was taught these scriptures. I was shown these scriptures and more. There's other scriptures, there's other evidence, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 4, because the first question I have, and many of you probably have the same question, what, what, what is the purpose of this speaking in tongues? We don't understand it. It's not coming from the mind. 1 Corinthians 14 says, he that speaks in an unknown tongue, uh, he, his spirit is speaking, his understanding is unfruitful, so it's not coming from our mind, it's coming from our spirit. And so my mind always went, well, what's the reason for it? There's got to be a reason for it. And until I understood that there was a reason for it, I didn't want to accept it. I didn't want to receive it because I always needed to know why. That's just the way my mind always worked. 
And so then the pastor and others that I was studying under, uh, they would uh, share with me, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it says uh, that he that speaks in an unknown tongue edifies himself, builds himself up, strengthens himself. And so that meant that as we speak in tongues, we pray in tongues. It's a prayer language to God. We're speaking mysteries unto God, things that we wouldn't know how to pray for. Romans 8 uh, and about verse, uh, I think it's about verse 14, 15, somewhere around there, 16. Uh, it says that, that sometimes we don't know how to pray for things as we ought to pray for, but the Holy Spirit helps us to pray for things we don't know how to pray for with groanings which cannot be uttered. How many of you know and how many of you can attest to the fact there's been times when you knew you needed to pray about something, but you didn't know how to begin? Anybody at all? Anybody besides me? I mean, many times I needed to pray for something, but I didn't know how to begin. And so what would I do? I'd say, Father, I need help praying. I, I know about this situation. I know about this individual. I know about it is, what it is, but I don't know how to pray. You know everything. The Holy Spirit in me knows everything. And so I'd ask him to help me, and he'd give me the words, and I'd pray in other tongues by faith uh, for that situation in the Spirit, in the Spirit. Your spirit prays. Amen. You read 1 Corinthians 14, you realize that. And there's so many other things. So anyway, when I saw these things in the Scripture, when I saw this thing called the baptism in the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit was of God and it was in the Bible, I decided, you know what, that's for me. I decided if it's in the Bible, if God wants me to have it, then I want to have it. I want everything God's got for me. I'm going to break down every barrier. I'm going to come against any tradition that says otherwise because the traditions of men makes the uh, power of God unavailable. It just uh, uh, hinders the word of God. Isn't that right? And so I'm going to set aside the traditions of men and I'm going to receive. So I went to my bedroom and I asked the Father because the Bible says in Luke chapter 13 verse 11, it says, if you, Jesus speaking, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more? Will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? And so I decided I'm going to go ask. And so I went into my bedroom and I said to the Father, I said, Father, this is what your word says. And so I'm asking you right now uh, to fill me with your Holy Spirit, to baptize me with the Holy Spirit. And I believe by faith I'm going to speak with other tongues as your Spirit gives me utterance. I prayed that prayer and nothing happened. Nothing happened. And so you know what, though? I had learned enough about faith in God's word. And what does faith in God's word say? Faith in God's word says that you believe it before you see it. You believe it before you see it. Abraham believed he was the father of many nations before, before his wife was pregnant. And he went around because God changed his name. He went around saying, I'm, I'm the father of many nations, the meaning of Abraham. I'm the father of many nations. I'm the father of many nations. No child. He tried to help out God by having Ishmael through Hagar, uh, but that, that was a mess. And so, uh, you know, he, he just continued to say, I'm the father of many nations. How many of you know faith says, I'm going to believe it, not because I see it or feel it. I'm going to believe it because God's word says so. Are, are you following what I'm saying? And Jesus said that we need to believe that we receive when we pray. Not when we feel different, not when we see things different, but when we pray, we believe that we receive. And so I prayed. I asked God to fill me with the Holy Spirit. I didn't feel anything. I didn't look any different. I didn't feel any different, but I prayed. And so even though I didn't speak, I said to God, God, I believe that I receive. I believe I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I believe the ability to pray in other tongues is on the inside of me. I believe it by faith. And, you know, it wasn't too long after that. I, I can't remember exactly how many years, or not years, how many days it was. It was only about days, but, you know, it was years ago that this happened, so I can't remember exactly. But I remember a few days after that, I'm in bed, middle of the night. And all of a sudden, I wake up, and I have these words that I don't understand just rolling on the inside of me, just rolling on the inside of me. I tried to open my mouth. I couldn't open my mouth. There was a battle going on there. And so they were there all the time. It's just that sometimes our head gets in the way. And by going to bed and sleeping a little bit, I guess my head got less busy, and I was able to, I was able to discern and able to hear those words on the inside. I can't explain it totally. All I know is God. And so I went to my pastor, and I told him the experience, and he just talked to me for a minute, and he said, well, just open your mouth, move your tongue, and, and just let God do it. And he laid hands on me. I opened my mouth, and I moved my tongue, and I began to speak in other tongues. Those words came out of my mouth, and I spoke and prayed in tongues for two hours straight. And you know what? That experience ruined all my plans. I couldn't be a forest ranger anymore. I couldn't go to forestry school anymore. These things that I had learned, 
these truths, this Bible that I've come to love, I had to share it with others. I had to share it with others. And God did a miracle. God did a miracle. And so then I went to Bible school and things. But soon after that, being filled with the Holy Spirit, I had another vision. And I'm not inclined toward visions. But the Bible does say that in the last days, young men will see visions and old men shall dream dreams, right? Yeah. And so this was a vision. Why? Because then I was a young man. I guess now maybe I dream dreams. I don't know. But, but anyway, I had a vision. I woke up in the middle of the night. And I saw what I know now would have been like a collage of people's faces. And I can still see those faces right now. And I knew, I knew intuitively that they were lost people, that they were destined for hell. They, they didn't have Christ in their heart. And I knew then as well, as God just intuitively shared with me on the inside, that I needed to do my part to keep people from going to hell. And so that is part of what changed my whole life. God has a way of turning things around. He has a way of changing people's lives. Amen? Amen. And, you know, I know that a lot of people, you know, not as much as it used to be, but some people say, well, this tongues thing, I, I don't get that. It's not about the tongues. It's about a relationship with the Holy Spirit and letting the Holy Spirit move in your life. Thank God for the spiritual language that we can pray Thank God for that spiritual language that we can worship in. It has enhanced my life. It changed everything. It gave me a boldness that I never had before. And the Bible became like a new book to me because we're, we're trying to read it before as a, as a boy. I didn't understand it. I tried to read it. I didn't understand it. But when the Holy Spirit baptized me, when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible became like another book to me. It doesn't mean I understand it totally now. Nobody does. But what it means is the Holy Spirit is called our teacher. And because he's our teacher and he's influenced our lives, he is able to open up the scriptures to us better the more influence he has in our lives. Amen. Amen. And so I share these things with you to let you know that God is a powerful God and that he wants to minister and demonstrate his power in everybody's life. He's interested in all of us, and none of us are beyond, beyond what God can do. If God can do something in me, I, I was never on drugs, never on alcohol, but I was still in bondage. I was in bondage to that, that shyness, that inferiority. I was in bondage to all these things. I was in bondage to, to a certain degree hating people. And it wasn't really a hate the more. I think it was more a fear of people. I was in bondage to that. But yet God set me free. Amen. Amen. And he wants to do the same for any and change their lives around. If he can change me, if he can do a work in me, he can do a work in anybody. I'm convinced of that. God is no respecter of persons. The Bible says that repeatedly, that he does not show partiality. What he does for one, he'll do for the other. Isn't that right? Amen. Would you stand with me? Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Father God, I thank you for, for just uh, helping me to convey this today. I pray it helps somebody. I pray that it encourages somebody, Father God. I pray, that, I pray that if there's anybody here today that's never had an experience with Jesus Christ, that they would realize that he is very real, perhaps like they've never realized that before, that they will realize that he wants to change their lives and come into their life today. I pray, Father God, that the reality of Jesus would permeate the soul of each and every person here today like you did for me those many, many years ago. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around, if you're here today and you say, I've never received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I've never experienced him. I don't have a relationship with him. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow could be too late. Later today could be too late. And so I encourage you today. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make you come up front. But before God, would you lift your hand and say, I need Jesus in my life today, lest there be one today. You've never accepted Christ as Lord. I see one hand. Anybody else? You'd say, I, I know I need Jesus. I see a couple of hands. Anybody else? You know you need Christ in your life. He wants to change your life around. He wants to help you in every way. I see another hand. I see another hand. Praise God. What we're going to do is we're all going to pray. And if you mean this with all your heart, I want you to know that God will change your life. He starts on the inside. 
He makes you a new creation on the inside. You're born of the Spirit, the Bible says. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, and 10 that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. And so we're going to pray a prayer that lines up with that scripture. So let's all just pray this together. Those of you that are already saved, let's just all pray and support those that are praying for the first time. Let's pray this. God in heaven, I thank you that Jesus died for my sins. He died so I could have life. And so today, I confess Jesus as my Lord. I believe with all my heart that he not only died, but he rose again. And I thank you, Father, for sending your son. Today I turn from my old life, and I give you my life. I surrender to you. Take my life and make it what you will. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's just thank the Lord. Shall we just thank him right now? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, you know, the Bible says, as I've already mentioned, that now you're a new creation. Something changed on the inside. You became a new person. God has forgiven you of your sins. There's new things to come. God has a plan for your life, just like he did for me. It was contrary to my plans, but that's okay. Because when you make him Lord, that means he's in charge now. Amen? Amen. And so I want to encourage you, on your way out at the table, uh, one of our ushers or someone will be at the table, they have a packet to give you with a New Testament and some other uh, literature to help you know what to do. And also, if you'd be so kind as to fill out a card so that I can follow up and talk with you and pray with you, answer questions that you might have as well. And as far as this baptism in the Holy Spirit, I'm out of time. But I want you to ponder those things. I want you to look up the Scripture. If you would like me to, at any time, pray with you to receive the filling of the Holy Spirit, often we do it here. I won't do it here right now because the children are ready to go probably. But I want to be able to pray with you. I'm available. It's easy, and it'll change your life. I remember one time in Portugal, I was a missionary in Portugal for three years. Fifty people just in mass got baptized in the Holy Spirit and spoke in other tongues. It changed their lives. It'll change your life. So if you have questions about that, just let me know. Contact me. Do whatever. And I, I want to help you with that as well. Amen? God is good. Amen?